Well, welcome back to the uh, GRUK conference. My name is Darren Moore. I'm the minister of Chelmsford Presbyterian Church and one of the, the organisers, as uh, Michael just mentioned. And uh, so if you've got yourself to answer um, Michael's question, I've got a builder's tea. But uh, so hopefully you had a nice break or maybe you just listened to Michael Twitter about where people are watching from. Uh, either way, it doesn't matter. But as we restart, before I introduce the next uh, parts of the conference, let's, uh, let's pray together. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we ask you be with each of us now, wherever we are in the world. Please, would you feed us and equip us? Would you sustain our technology, both um, those of us sending content and those receiving, uh, that we might um, receive from you, that you would uh, use us, that in all of us uh, participating now may glorify you in the suffering that we minister to and the suffering that we experience. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in a moment, we're going to show you uh, a short video um, by uh, Mark Johnson, who's going to explain the UK scene. It's going to say something about himself as well. It surprises a lot of people in the UK and it, probably more so those outside of the UK, particularly in the States, uh, to know what the church scene here is like, uh, depending on which poll you, you refer to. Around about 11% on a good Sunday will come to church once. That's of every kind of church, including some that you might not even consider a, a real church. When you talk about conservative evangelicals, so for those outside of the UK, particularly Americans, uh, a gospel coalition kind of church, you're looking at a, a, a fraction of that would be in one of those kind of churches. So probably 1%, 2% if we're being generous and optimistic. Of the kind of reformed confessional kind of churches, the, the sort of people that are involved in uh, this afternoon, well, for me, after this afternoon's um, conference, confessional Presbyterian type people, not to diminish the others. We're talking about a tiny percentage of that percentage. Uh, I mean, obviously, regional varies around, variations around, around the nation. So that's what we're kind of dealing with. And that's part of why we uh, promote the things that we do. And Mark is going to explain to you a bit more about the situation uh, that we're in. Good afternoon or good evening, depending on the world, where in the world you might happen to be at this point in time. Uh, my name is Mark Johnston um, and the conference organizers have very kindly asked me to say just a few words about myself, uh, the work I'm involved in and some of the challenges facing the churches here in the UK at this present time. Currently, I'm the minister of Bethel Evangelical Presbyterian Church in Cardiff uh, in Wales in the UK. Uh, we're a, a medium-sized congregation, uh, but we're made up of a very diverse mix of people from different walks of life um, and different parts of the world. And it's a pleasure to be their pastor. And they never cease to be a source of huge encouragement to me uh, and to my family. Originally, I'm from Northern Ireland, uh, and I trained for the ministry in Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia back in the 1980s. Uh, and when I got back to Ireland in 1984, I was asked to plant a church near the cathedral city of Armagh in Northern Ireland, about 35 miles west of Belfast. This was a huge challenge um, and, and we ended up starting with just one other family as we got the church underway. But uh, in his goodness, God blessed that work over the space of the, the 10 years we were there and it grew uh, and it flourished before we eventually moved on. In 1994, uh, I was called to be the pastor of Grove Chapel in Camberwell, southeast London. Uh, very different from what we'd known in Ireland in that this was uh, uh, an old and historic church with uh, uh, 200 years of history behind it, almost uh, a succession of, of uh, men who'd served it faithfully and well in that time. But it was located also in a very cosmopolitan and secular community. We spent 16 years there in the end. Uh, and during that time, we learned a great deal about life generally, um, but especially about ministry uh, in the kind of world we live in today. In 2010, I was called to Proclamation Presbyterian Church, which is a, a PCA congregation in the western suburbs of, of, of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania. 
And in many ways, that proved to be the biggest challenge of my ministry so far. Uh, but it also proved to be a very joyful challenge. Our, our time there turned out to be cut short for reasons that nobody could have expected. Uh, but during that brief time that we spent in the U.S., God did a very special work in proclamation, and it was a, a real privilege to be part of it. And the bonds of friendship and fellowship that we forged with people there have endured ever since. Having, having served on both sides of the Atlantic and indeed on both sides of the RAC, I'm very conscious of just how great are the challenges facing, uh, facing churches here in the UK at this present time, especially those that hold to reformed convictions. Even though Britain was the cradle of the Reformation in the English-speaking world, for, for many years the re Reformed faith went into sharp decline um, and, and almost became extinct. All this began to change in the late 1940s, early 1950s, with the influence of men like Jim Packer and Martin Lloyd-Jones and their ministry and their teaching. Uh, but it gathered momentum in the late 50s, early 1960s, when the Banner of Truth Trust was founded under the influence of of Ian Murray uh, and others who, who had shared the vision with him to, to rediscover the Reformed faith and to promote it afresh in churches throughout our land. It's been my privilege to serve as one of the trustees of Banner of Truth for almost 25 years. And, and it's just thrilling to see the growing appetite uh, for reformed books and literature that we publish, uh, but also to attend the, the reformed uh, conferences that we organize, uh, not just here in the UK, but in the US and in Australia also. It's also a, a wonderful joy to see the growing number of younger ministers here in the UK um, who are just eager to push forward with a vision for planting churches uh, in our land, churches that um, are reformed in their vision, churches that uh, love the, the truths of the Reformation, but also have a deep passion uh, for the kind of worship that came out of the Reformation, deep and rich and reverent. But they also have a, a great desire to get the gospel out uh, to a nation that has lost its spiritual moorings and desperately needs the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ and his salvation. Please pray for the work in our churches here in the UK throughout our land and that God may pour out his spirit in ways that haven't been seen uh, for many a generation um, and that God himself would be seen to be on the move in a time when we need him more than ever before. Well, as uh, we said earlier, uh, welcome. We are uh, GRUK or Gospel Reformation UK. We want to welcome you to, uh, if I've noticed on, on Facebook, various people still joining us as the, uh, as the day goes on. So uh, welcome to Zoom Utopia. And uh, what we try to do as, a, as, a, uh, as an organisation is to provide materials, this conference, blogs, videos, and, uh, and a podcast called uh, Grecology. As you can see, some of these names are um, derived by committee. And uh, we want to serve to, to build up th uh, the church. Take a look at our website, which is gr-uk.org. We also have a link there to um, our bookstore. If you're watching on YouTube, on Facebook or on Periscope, uh, then subscribe to the, the, to the YouTube channel, like our Facebook page and follow our Periscope and Twitter accounts. Uh, we will keep on putting contents up there, so um, hopefully you'll go and have a look at that and enjoy it. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, um, we, we're not charging anything. Uh, we've um, got a couple of expenses. Josh upgraded some of his software and things. Uh, there is a place on the website to donate if, you, if you'd like to, or if you just go to the website I gave you, gr-uk.org backslash donations. Our next speaker is uh, Gary Williams, who's going to talk about suffering in the life of John Calvin. Uh, I think Gary and I worked out we've known each other for almost half of our lives. Whenever I've done any serious theological study, he ends up having to having to teach me. And, and yet somehow uh, we've stayed friends. Uh, Gary does a number of things. He's um, a visiting professor in a number of places, but his uh, main job is he's the director of Pastor Academy. Pastor Academy is uh, a ministry of uh, London Seminary. And uh, so London Seminary trains ministers. Pastors Academy is for um, 
refreshing those of us who are in pastoral ministry. So they do a number of things. They uh, do Greek and Hebrew refresher days. Uh, they do theology and ethics roadshows and things at the seminary. They do uh, provide pastoral support for pastors and various practical uh, workshops and, and seminars for them. Uh, they also, through Puritan Reformed Seminary, um, Gary and Pastors Academy uh, runs their pro a postgraduate program for students based in, in the UK and Europe. So I'm going to hand over now to, to Gary Williams. Thank you, Gary. Well, hello, everyone. It's great to be with you this afternoon uh, on Zoom Utopia, wherever you are. I'm in Luton in the UK, near Luton Airport. And we're going to think together this afternoon about suffering the life of John Calvin. Many find Calvinism itself forbidding, and they find Calvin even more so. It's quite hard to get close to the man, John Calvin. He once said, I speak of myself unwillingly. And he was famously buried when he died in an unmarked grave. He's a lot less approachable than Martin Luther. If you look at pictures of them, you can see that Calvin is long and thin and precise and reserved, perhaps unflinching. Whereas Luther appears much more lively and engaging. And we know more about Luther's sense of humor than we do Calvin's. Calvin was also incredibly successful. His success itself might be intimidating. You think about his writings, uh, the Institutes, obviously, uh, the various treatises, the incredible commentaries, which many pastors still consult today. And he becomes intimidating simply because of how successful he was on paper. But then you think about his ministry as well. Geneva, famously the most perfect school of Christ. France, Scotland, Poland, Germany, even England, massively impacted by Calvin's Reformation and his teaching. He was, you might think, a colossus of the Reformation, striding effortlessly over the European scene of the 16th century. That's Calvin. And then there's you and there's me achieving so little, stuck in our studies at home, struggling so much. Maybe we think the 16th century was a golden age. Secretly, we'd love to go back there to join Calvin in the company of pastors in Geneva. Well, I wonder what you think about that idea. WWCS, what would Calvin say to such an idea? I can tell you exactly what he'd say. He'd say, whatever you do, don't do it. Choose a hundred other afflictions, but flee from Geneva, because Calvin had an awful time in Geneva, and there is much to learn from him for our own perseverance today. Let me pray that we would do that this afternoon. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your servants of the past. Thank you for their example. We remember how the Apostle Paul said that we should imitate him as he imitated Christ. And we thank you that well, there's a great cloud of witnesses that we can imitate from across the centuries where they imitated Christ. And so we pray that you would help us now to learn from the struggles and suffering of John Calvin for our own lives and ministry. And we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Calvin in many senses was like Job. Remember, Satan claims that God has hedged Job in. He says, does Job fear God for nothing? Haven't you placed a hedge around him, his household, and everything he owns? And in the book of Job, as you know, that protective hedge is then torn down piece by piece. Animals, servants, children, his own body in the end. And Job strikingly takes that same language that Satan has used. He obviously wasn't aware of that. Uh, the language of being hedged in and applies it to himself. He asks in chapter 3, verse 23, why is life given to a man whose path is hidden, whom God has hedged in? So the hedging in for Job has become a bitter experience of being hemmed in by trouble, not by protection, but by trouble on every side. That's a, a point of comparison with Calvin, because Calvin faced extraordinary hostility 
on every side in his public and in his personal life. Here's how he put it. He wrote this. I say nothing of fire and sword and exiles and all the furious attacks of our enemies. I say nothing of slanders and other such vexations. How many things there are within that are far worse. Ambitious men openly attack us. Impudent men insult us. Hypocrites rage against us. Those who are wise after the flesh do us harm indirectly, and we're harassed in many different ways on every side. It is, in short, a great miracle that weighed down by the burden of such a heavy and dangerous office, any one of us should persevere. So what were the hedges that surrounded Calvin on every side? Well, to start with, Calvin lived with a pervasive sense of the imminence of death. It's obvious, isn't it, when we think about it, that Christians uh, living, I suppose, outside the West and or in previous centuries would have a spirituality more markedly shaped by death than ours is, those of us in the contemporary West, at least. Now, there are some who live who are seriously unwell and have an abiding sense of their mortality. As people age, many, of course, live with more of a sense of their mortality, although not all. There are plenty of elderly and even sick people who manage to avoid confronting the fact of their own imminent death. And the coronavirus might bring more of a sense of mortality to many people, though I think we might be overly optimistic about that, and many will quickly forget whatever it is that's taught them. But Calvin couldn't do that. He expressed the vulnerability of life in the 16th century in a very striking passage in the Institutes. Here's how he puts it. Innumerable are the evils that beset human life. Innumerable too the deaths that threaten it. We need not go beyond ourselves. Since our body is the receptacle of a thousand diseases, in fact holds within itself and fosters the causes of diseases, a man cannot go about unburdened by many forms of his own destruction and without drawing out a life enveloped, as it were, with death. For what else would you call it when he neither freezes nor sweats without danger? Now, wherever you turn, all things around you not only are hardly to be trusted, but almost openly menace and seem to threaten immediate death. Embark upon a ship. You are one step away from death. Mount a horse. If one foot slips, your life is imperiled. Go through the city streets. You are subject to as many dangers as there are tiles on the roofs. If there is a weapon in your hand or a friend's, harm awaits. All the fierce animals you see are armed for your destruction. But if you try to shut yourself up in a walled garden, seemingly delightful, there a serpent sometimes lies hidden. Your house continually in danger of fire, threatens in the daytime to impoverish you, at night even to collapse upon you. Your field, since it is exposed to hail, frost, drought, and other calamities, threatens you with barrenness and hence famine. I pass over poisonings, ambushes, robberies, open violence, which in part besiege us at home, in part dog us abroad. Amid these tribulations, must not man be most miserable? since but half alive in life, he weakly draws his anxious and languid breath as if he had a sword perpetually hanging over his neck. And indeed, we might note that the military threat was real to Geneva in the 16th century, and that within the city there was politically, theologically motivated murder. So Calvin lived with the constant sense of death, surpassing what most of us have today. There's another contemporary link, like the coronavirus, and that's to the theme of refugees. We think of uh, those fleeing the chaos in the Middle East. Well, Calvin himself was a refugee. He was, of course, French. He said wistfully, his native soil is sweet to everyone, and it is sweet to dwell among one's own people. But that, from 1534 and his mid-twenties on, he himself could never do. He wrote of how hard it is to have to find safety by inflicting a voluntary exile on oneself. You see, he never wanted to be in 
Geneva. He tried to pass quietly by the city, and you may remember the famous story of Guillaume Farrell, who prayed a curse on the quietness that Calvin was seeking if he wouldn't stay in Geneva and help the cause of the Reformation. He then faced another exile, this time from Geneva, and went to Strasbourg because he was thrown out by the Genevan authorities for a few years. When they invited him back and he returned to Geneva, he said, rather would I submit to a hundred other deaths than to that cross on which one must perish daily a thousand times. Not exactly enthusiasm for the role. Within just six weeks of being back in the city, he could say, I am entangled in so many troublesome affairs that I'm almost beside myself. And what were those affairs that constantly entangled him in his time in Geneva? Well, perhaps most basically, they were just the demands of the job. He preached twice each Sunday. Every other week, he preached each weekday morning at 6 or 7 a.m. That means he often preached eight sermons in a week. He preached around 4,000 sermons in all after his return, averaging more than 170 sermons a year. There were, of course, other services as well. In the 1550s, there are 270 weddings, 50 baptisms. And don't forget, he wasn't only a pastor. He was also teaching in the academy. He lectured three times a week on theology, and he spoke in the consistory, in the church courts. He ran a Bible class every Friday. If ever anyone was hemmed in by sheer activity, it was John Calvin. Maybe he had a great team to help him? Well, certainly not at the start. Of his colleagues, he said one was of a touchy or rather savage character. The other was wily and sly. He commented, they had no thought even in dreams about what it means to direct a church. For the first 14 years after his return to Geneva, he was beset by the opposition, the schemes of his enemies. They fell into two main groups. On the one hand, there were the refugees who, like him, had come in to the city. And on the other, there were the old Genevans, or the Libertines, as they were known. Cal uh, Geneva was in Calvin's day largely a city of refugees, and it was like a beacon for anyone seeking to escape Roman Catholic oppression. But that meant all sorts of uh, individuals came with strange and radical ideas, fi figures like Michael Servetus. There were constant doctrinal battles in the city because of this. So Calvin found himself, found himself not only opposing Rome, for example, Cardinal Sadaletto, who tried to encourage the Genevans to return to the Roman fold, but also the radicals like Servetus who denied the doctrine of the incarnation, the doctrine of the Trinity, those who denied God's sovereign grace, such as Bolsec, and of course, sadly, even the Lutherans with whom there was a massive controversy over the Lord's Supper. The list just goes on and on of people with whom Calvin had to engage. So that his colleague, his successor, Beza, commented, there will be found no heresy ancient or revived or newly founded in our time, which he did not destroy down to its foundations. So that was the people coming into the city causing Calvin trouble. And then there were the old Genevans, the powerful rulers of the city. And this was ongoing trouble, most of them because of their ungodly lifestyle. But it got really bad when in 1552, Amy Perrin became the first syndic, the leading authority in the city. Sometimes people think, by the way, that Calvin had a lot of political power in the city. He had no direct political power. He didn't hold political office. And for most of his time there, he wasn't even a citizen of Geneva. So Amy Perrin, by contrast, had immense political power and Calvin experienced relentless opposition. He wrote to a friend, to Bullinger, if I simply said it was daytime at high noon, they would begin to doubt it. They opposed him, in other words, at every turn whenever they could. I wonder if you've ever considered quitting from your ministry role if you're a pastor watching today. My suspicion is that there are probably, if you've been, for among any who've been in the ministry for any length of time, there are probably few who don't ever consider quitting. I think of one minister known to some who are watching today who was in post for more than 40 years. And he commented once at a conference that he considered resigning 
every month for 20 years. At that point in the conference, the hearers laughed, but he said, I mean it, I'm not fooling around. Well, Calvin also got to that point. In October 1553, in the midst of this opposition, he asked to be allowed to resign from his post, but he wasn't allowed to. In a sermon in December 1554, he said, if it were up to me, I would want God to remove me from this world and that I should not have to live here three days in such disorder as there is here. Now, things did get better for Calvin. They got better in 1555 when his supporters really won at the elections in the city because of a change in the voting rules, allowing more of the incomers into the city to vote. From then on, things were much better for Calvin. But that was just the last nine years of his time in the city. Most of his public ministry that was very, very difficult and he faced constant opposition. So you may say, well, that's what's going on in public for Calvin. But, but what about in his home? Maybe in his home, maybe there was an oasis there. Maybe he could come home and experience peace and tranquility, a refuge from his troubles. Not at all. Here, too, Calvin was hedged in. In fact, as the political troubles eased in 1555, the domestic troubles were to intensify. Calvin was deeply affected by his brother's wife's deception and adultery. His brother and his brother's wife lived in Calvin's house with him, and she was accused of adultery with a servant in the house as well as others, and of theft from the house. Calvin wrote in February 1557 to Farrell, you have no idea, my dear Farrell, with how many ambushes and clandestine machinations Satan daily assaults us. Though the state of the public affairs be tranquil, it is not allowed for all that to everybody to enjoy repose. Our private calamity almost completely absorbs us. The judges find no way of disengaging my brother. I interpret their blindness as a just punishment for our own, because for upward of two years, though I was pillaged by a thief, I saw nothing. My brother perceived neither the thief nor the adulterer. Now, what about his own marriage? Well, he married Idolette de Bure in 1540, and they were happily married, but it was still a life shot through with tragedy. They had at least three, possibly four, children, all of whom died in infancy. On the 28th of July, 1542, Idolette gave birth prematurely to little Jacques, and he died soon afterwards. Calvin expressed his grief. The Lord inflicted on us a grave and painful wound in the death of our beloved son. But he is our father. He knew what was good for his children. In 1545, Idolette herself became ill. And in March 1549, after just nine years of marriage with Calvin still under 40 and going to live another 15 years, Idolette died. He wrote of his grief in a letter just over a week late, later. I have been bereaved of the best companion of my life. He wrote to another friend, I try as much as possible not to be entirely beaten down by grief. Calvin faced extraordinary difficulty in his public ministry and in his private life. And he also had bad health. Throughout his life, he experienced terrible migraine headaches. He probably, from what we can tell of the symptoms, had pleurisy in the mid 1550s. He was room bound in 1558 for several months. In 1559, he could hardly speak and he spat blood. He suffered regularly from hemorrhoids, from gout, and in later years from kidney stones. He wrote graphically to Bullinger about his struggle 
to pass a kidney stone the size of a hazelnut. I will spare you the account. It is an extraordinary catalogue of suffering in the life of one man, often ill, the death of three children and his wife, opposed by Genevans and foreigners alike, constantly with an incredible workload, living against the background of the threat of death. Truly, on every front, Calvin was hedged in. So we can learn much by asking, what was it that kept him going in the face of such encompassing hardship? And can we learn something from it, for our own struggles today, many of which for most of us will be far more slight? Well, may I remind you of the obvious? We need to be reminded. Calvin was Calvinist. And that doesn't just mean that he subscribed objectively out there, if you like, to some kind of theological system. Calvin's Calvinism, we know he would have hated the term, but his Calvinism, his Augustinianism, his Paulinism, his biblical Christianity was experimental, as we might call it today. He lived his Calvinism. He had deep existential convictions about the sovereignty of God, convictions concerning the good purposes of God. These convictions wrought in him a number of abiding dispositions in his life, which allowed him to see his situation differently. It's a great example, I think, of how there is no necessary causal link between affliction on the one hand and a response of unbelief on the other. Sometimes we may fear that there is. If we face great affliction, it will dismantle our faith. Some use affliction as an excuse or a justification for their unbelief, as if one follows the other, as night follows day. But it doesn't. And Calvin's example clearly shows that. So what were those convictions that sustained him? The first of all is quite simple. It's that he expected to suffer. He wrote this to French brothers in November 1559, facing persecution after the young Francis II had acceded to the French throne under the influence of the Roman Catholic, very anti-Protestant Guise family. Calvin explained that Suffering the Christian life is the obvious consequence of our union with Christ, because we are united to Christ, but we're specifically united to Christ in his death. He said that the Father, by sufferings, wishes us to be conformed to the image of his Son, as it is fitting that there should be conformity between the head and the members. Refusal of this, Calvin explained, is really hard to comprehend in a Christian. He wrote, it is horrible that those who call themselves Christians should be so stupid or rather brutalized as to renounce Jesus Christ as soon as he displays his cross. Did you really think you could be a Christian, he's asking, and not carry a cross? That is basic in the Christian life. So I ask you, is your life hard? Is your ministry tough? Is mine? Well, what did we expect? What did we expect when we were joined to Christ crucified? It's a great question to ask, isn't it? Because it is very easy to be influenced by the world's quest for ease. Much of the world, much of life in the world is about seeking a place of ease. And I need to ask myself, is that my goal in my life? That is not the calling of Christ upon our lives. So Calvin expected suffering. Secondly, Calvin was greatly encouraged by God's providence. That is to say, by his confidence that God is utterly sovereign and in control of, and as Calvin would say, does not merely 
permit, but even ordains all the things that happen in the creation. That passage I read earlier from the Institutes about death waiting around every corner, the roof tile falling on the head, occurs in the context of Calvin's discussion of divine providence in the Institutes. And he is considering in that context the practical uses of the doctrine of providence. Immediately after that catalogue of perils that surround us within and without, he counters the fear with these words. Yet, when that light of divine providence has once shone upon a godly man, he is then relieved and set free, not only from the extreme anxiety and fear that were pressing him before, but from every care. For as he justly dreads fortune, so he fearlessly dares commit himself to God. See the pastoral power of this insight in Calvin's own life. It becomes apparent after the death of baby Jacques. What did he say afterwards? He didn't say, well, you know, it was beyond God's control. I'm confident that God had nothing to do with it. No, he couldn't have said anything more different. He said, the Lord inflicted on us a grave and painful wound. But, Calvin adds, the Lord who inflicts is also our Father. A Father, he says, who knew what was good for his children. Calvin loved to put these two titles for God together, Lord and Father. He knew in his own experience the pastoral power of this. You can see him writing about his baby's death and reflecting on it himself, using it with himself to speak to himself. And you see him using it with others too. In the Institutes, for example, he writes that the believer's solace is to know that his heavenly father so holds all things in his power so rules by his authority and will, so governs by his wisdom, that nothing can befall except he determined. You see that pairing there again, the Father, and all that language expressing God's sovereignty. It is our heavenly Father who has total power over everything and can therefore order all things to our good. It is for Calvin awareness of God as our father that keeps us from thinking that we are the victims of a cruel tyrant. He writes, as if God were making sport of men by throwing them about like bulls. No, Calvin holds together knowledge of God as Lord and as Father. Calvin was interestingly unafraid about saying that to others who were suffering. This is what he wrote to the French brothers facing persecution. According then to what is said in the psalm, we should prepare our backs for stripes. If that condition is hard and painful, let us be satisfied that our Heavenly Father, in exposing us to death, turns it to our eternal welfare. We are forced to conclude that whatever he orders is the best thing we could desire. And that's a pretty astonishing statement, isn't it? And it's very striking that Calvin was bold to write that to those facing persecution and death. We must conclude that whatever God orders, it is the best thing we could desire. God is sovereign Lord and our kind 
Father, purposing even in the midst of suffering our good. Now, there are some who would say, even some who believe that, would say we shouldn't say it to somebody who is suffering. That was definitely not Calvin's approach. If we lose this insight, and there are many who not only lose it, but theologically argue against it, I think of uh, so-called open theism, for example, well, that will surely yield pastoral disaster. As Calvin puts it, ignorance of providence is the ultimate of all miseries. The highest blessedness lies in the knowledge of it. We don't help anyone by going silent on the fact that God is sovereign over what is happening to them and that he purposes their good even in the midst of it. So Calvin was greatly strengthened by his knowledge of God's providence. Thirdly, Calvin knew that Christians can never actually lose. They are never truly defeated and they are never truly poor. We are always rich, Calvin said, because we have Christ. He wrote this to one who was suffering imperial hostility. If the whole world should be taken away from you, there would yet remain the consolation to which we must chiefly betake ourselves, namely to yield ourselves up entirely. It is certain that having the Son of God, we suffer no injury in being deprived of all else. For thus highly ought we to prize him. Having the Son of God, we suffer no injury in being deprived of all else. For thus highly ought we to prize him. And if we grasp, in other words, the richness of what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, we will never think that we are poor, no matter what we lose. Now, perhaps at this point, you're beginning to think that he's sounding like he was indeed a colossus who strode over suffering without feeling it, um, as if it had no kind of emotional impact on him. But that's not, that's not at all what he's saying. Actually, Calvin believed in fear, and he believed in the importance of fear. And nothing that he said here should be mistaken as a denial of the reality of fear in the Christian life. Actually, Calvin was clear that fear is where hope is born, that you only get real hope emerging in the context of real fear. This is how he puts it. Experience shows that hope truly reigns where fear occupies part of the heart. For hope does not operate in a tranquil mind. Nay, it is almost dormant, but it exerts its power where it uplifts a spirit worn down by cares, soothes it when troubled by grief, and supports it when stricken by terror. And we might add that that, of course, is what we see supremely in the Garden of Gethsemane, where the Lord Jesus Christ himself experienced fear, did not have a tranquil mind in the face of the agony that was about to come upon him, but reacted with fear, but with godly fear, from which was born a hope that enabled him to persevere and to drink the cup for us. Calvin is not saying that we should never be afraid. So, brothers and sisters, we see in John Calvin a man really terribly afflicted on every side in all sorts of ways. And yet he says to us across the centuries, remember that you will suffer. Expect nothing less because you have been gloriously united to the Lord Jesus Christ and to him crucified. And as you suffer, recall that whatever the Lord orders, 
is somehow the best thing for us, coming to us from our kind Heavenly Father. No matter how it feels, your world is not ever careering out of his control. And pray that as fear rightly occupies part of your heart, hope will in that context reign. Should we pray together? Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we do pray in particular for any watching today who find themselves in particularly difficult circumstances, be that their own health, the condition of loved ones around them, their public ministry. Please, in the midst of their fear, would you produce great hope? Please, would you strengthen in them by your spirit a confidence that you are their good heavenly father, somehow purposing good, even in the midst of this current season of affliction. And we pray that such convictions, Heavenly Father, would abide in all of us through the course of our lives, in the midst of the different sufferings that we face. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.